Um, so welcome to Minus 2020. I hope you've all seen the um, notice at the bottom of the uh, of the screen, um, which um, kind of says that we are recording this. So if you don't want to be seen uh, or if you don't want to be heard, uh, please uh, switch off your camera and mute your microphone. Uh, there's just a chance that your name might pop up if we get a screen grab somewhere uh, between presentations, but um, otherwise we will be recording this and we hope to put this up on the UK Mars YouTube channel and we will link that to our other online uh, platforms as well. So you should be able to see these presentations afterwards. Okay. Um, the other thing I'll say is that uh, um, we're, we're doing this virtually for obvious reasons this year. Um, and um, just a caution to people that it takes, sometimes it can take 20 seconds for video sync to catch up with things as, as change around. So uh, bear with us as um, presenters come and switch on different presentations and screens. Um, and presenters, just be warned, it does take sometimes 20 seconds for everything to jiggle itself into the right place for you when you start presenting. So uh, first of all, thank you for joining. Great turnout, really good to see. And my special thanks to the people that have uh, agreed to present today, uh, because without uh, these guys, then we'd have no conference whatsoever. So thanks for that. Um, we, will, we will take a break um, about uh, halfway through. Um, and in that break, uh, there will be a, a, a quiz, which I'll send you a link to, uh, that we'll, we'll go to the answers to just before we restart again with Rob, uh, with some history for us there. Um, so if you could hold questions, I think we're given the technology that we're trying to work with here. If you could hold questions at the end of an individual's presentation, uh, that would be useful. And uh, also, if you're not uh, presenting or speaking, if you could turn your microphone on to mute. That will probably stop us getting distracted by extraneous sounds of people dropping their cups and, and that kind of stuff. OK, um, so enough of me talking about this stuff. Um, I will move on to the first item, which is uh, Peter. Um, talking about uh, maze timer sensors. I won't steal his title. Uh, I'll just stop sharing the screen. And if we could wait for a couple of minutes uh, or a minute, Peter's, uh, Peter's can take over and start presenting. Hi, Arjit. Just have a good cough before starting, <laughs> just to get everybody in the right frame of mind. Good, good morning. Is my voice coming through now? Your voice is coming yes, through. Is. You. I can't if see we, my video. If no, we, we can ask you to um, mute your mic um, during presentations, and then um, that should make life a little easier. <clears throat> anyway, I shall begin. This is weird because you just assume everybody's listening. Actually, it's a bit like being in a classroom. So maze timer, um, mouse detection. Originally, I was going to be doing an entire uh, thing uh, at Minos about the maze timing system. Uh, and I've cut that back now to just the business of detecting the mouse in the maze. This is a remarkably difficult thing to do. It turns out, <clears throat> I guess I thought it was going to be easy, but it turns out not to be. We have some requirements. And the first of those is that we must have better than one millisecond uh, timing resolution. Uh, races have been won and lost on milliseconds in difference, 10 milliseconds or so. <clears throat> and so it's important that the timing system is, uh, has good resolution and is reliable. There must also be low latency because uh, whilst it's easy enough to detect, well, 
it's not easy enough to detect a mouse but once you've detected a mouse you don't want some arbitrary delay between the detection and the recording of the time <clears throat> if you had a delay so long as it was consistent that would be fine but ideally it should be very low we have issues with ambient light so those of you who were at Hazelmere uh, a couple of sessions ago may recall the marching sunbeam that went across the room uh, and made its way towards the maze timing system and we were busy juggling the curtains to try and stop the sun shining on the sensors. Uh, in APEC, a couple of APEX ago, we were right by a big loading bay and there was enormous amounts of light pouring in and we had to uh, during the runs, test runs, we had to wait until uh, it got darker before we could do it. So all these things are not good. <clears throat> and of course, one of the biggest sources of interference are the robots themselves, which pump out huge amounts of light um, at the most inopportune moments. So all in all, there's lots of things that kind of get up in your way of getting this right. And above all else, it's got to be easy to set up and use. So the options for different kinds of timers, uh, different kinds of sensors, um, turn out to be fairly constrained. Mechanical, electrical, and acoustic, and radio or radar, they all really not very, very practical. <clears throat> I have run in a contest that uses ultrasonic sensors. Uh, it wasn't great. They stick right, or they, in that case, they stuck right out into the cell, and they were just a big nuisance. So in the end, you're pretty much constrained to some form of optical sensing. You can try and bounce light off the mouse, or you can try and have the mouse break the sensor beam. And when you have a look at what that means in practice, that too turns out to have some issues. This is a side view of the UK Mars bot, and you can see that it's quite a complicated object. There are shiny bits, there are dark bits, there are holes and gaps, <clears throat> and bits dangling around all over the place. So you have to kind of try and take that into account. Are you looking for something to go dark? Are you looking for something to go light? What happens if it goes dark and then light again? The robot ideally will be going through quite quickly. So that's another issue. You don't want a system that can detect the mouse reliably, but takes so long to do so that it's been and gone by the time the job's ready. And of course, a mouse may stop halfway through, um, either by accident or because of a crash or because it thinks it's in there, in the cell, gone through the gate or whatever. And you wouldn't want a timing system that reacts adversely to that. So if it was self-adaptive, for example, it wouldn't want to think that that's the, the new normal. So if we try and reflect the light off there, we have a few options. David Otten um, presented some stuff to us a few years back in 2009 and 2010, and his first uh, sensor used uh, a reflective uh, setup, which I believe, I didn't ask, um, he can tell us later maybe, uh, I believe was simply um, like a conventional mouse sensor. So you shine a light out, <clears throat> you measure how much comes back, and you use that to determine whether the mouse is there. He said that the sensitivity was adjusted so that it didn't normally see the wall, and <clears throat> any change, darker or lighter, would be the mouse. The following year, he, he talked about an upgrade where he used his PSD sensors to detect the mouse. Uh, these are much uh, nicer in that they are much less dependent upon the ambient lighting conditions. So he would measure the distance to the wall on the other side of the gate. And if that distance changed, then something had gone through the gate. Um, Dave's skills in building these things far exceed mine, uh, and they require specialist devices which are not cheap or necessarily easy to get. The lenses in particular are difficult, uh, and so that's not something that I really particularly wanted to do. If we try and shine light across the gate and measure the mouse going through it, this is perhaps the most reliable method. 
Unfortunately, you need something either side of the gate, um, and that can cause alignment issues. Um, and you, generally speaking, have to get at those devices from underneath the maze. Um, Salviano can tell us later who this is, um, but uh, I'm not picking on the Portuguese. This uh, happens or has happened in the past. I have pictures of Tony Wilcox under the maze um, yeah. in, <laughs> in, Japan. <laughs> in Japan. In Japan. They um, they mount them before laying down the maze panels because they're flat on the ground. <clears throat> In Taiwan, they have to get to them from underneath. And it, it's altogether just a nuisance. The sensors they use in Japan and Taiwan, however, are quite good. Um, but then they would be because they're not cheap and they are designed for the job. These are commercial industrial light sensors. Uh, they come in pairs. Um, the actual fiber pair is 137 pounds in the UK. Uh, each pair has to be connected to an amplifier, that's 180 pounds. So you're talking six or 700 pounds worth of equipment just for one start gate and one stop gate. Uh, and I venture to suggest that that's somewhat outside our budget, even if we wanted to be poking stuff up from underneath the maze, which I would really rather not do. So if we want a transmissive sensor, which is intrinsically going to be more reliable, then what else can we do? Well, I should have said, by the way, that um, the transmissive sensors are synchronous. That is to say, they, they flash the light on and off and they detect the differences between the two. The Portuguese system does that, uh, and I believe the Omron sensors do the same thing. What we could try to do is to shine a constant light across the gap. We wouldn't need any connection or any communication between the two sides because it would, one side would just be a light shining all the time. And then we could use software to detect changes in illumination levels um, and use that to determine when the beam is being broken rather than rely on some kind of synchronous detection. Blue light um, is now readily available, and most mouse sensors are likely to be fairly insensitive to blue light, so that's a good thing. Uh, if you use too narrow a beam, like a laser, though, you have an issue with pointing uh, the thing and being reliably on target on the other side of the gap. So with a very narrow beam, you have to be remarkably accurate. Uh, on the left hand side, those narrow beam diagrams, those are only four degrees. So if you're off by more than four or five degrees, you're just going to miss the target altogether. A wide beam will be much more forgiving. Although it does look pretty awful, it looks like you've got a floodlight shining out on the maze. So what about the mouse itself in these configurations? Well, as long as the mouse is traveling orthogonally, neither the sensors nor the gate sensors will be too likely to interfere with each other. The forward facing sensors can get blinded or affect the, um, the gate sensor. We've had that in UK contests with poor collimation uh, of the gate sensor, um, killing a couple of mice and we had to reconfigure the maze so that people could get through it reliably. Um, and in a diagonal configuration, there is always a point where the mouse sensor is looking right down the throat of the gate sensor and vice versa. So you have to take that into account. Um, and even if your mouse isn't traveling diagonally, it's gonna be turning. And at some point, trust me, it's gonna be looking right into that sensor and you really don't want it to be blinded. So with a wide beam and blue light in a darkened room in the privacy of your own home, this is what it looks like. Uh, it looks a bit scary, it's kind of bright, um, but you'll see that I could be quite some way out in terms of illumination, uh, in terms of pointing the sensor and still get a reasonably good uh, signal on the other side. In more normal lighting, it, it doesn't look nearly so bad. And in competition lighting, you probably would hardly see it at all, but <clears throat> it is a little alarming when you see it for the first time, how much light is flooding out. 
My mail sense is certainly um, are largely unaffected by this. I haven't been able to kill the mouse going through it. Um, so that's good. Uh, there would normally have been a whole bunch of stuff about the uh, makeup of the sensors themselves, but I'll content myself with a picture of the assemblies. Uh, the detector shown in the middle, sorry, the emitter shown in the middle is simply um, uh, an LED with a current limiting resistor. I've got some surplus cell phone batteries. They're about 800 milliamp hours. They last all day. Uh, the circuit board on there is just a full five volt um, DC to DC converter and charge controller for the lithium cell. Little on off switch, job done. It all sits inside a conventional common plastic maze wall. The slot in the PCB is because I couldn't dig down far enough to get rid of the internal ribs in the maze wall, so it just slots over that. At the top, the emitter. Uh, sorry, at the top, the detector has um, the same battery arrangement, a little Arduino micro, uh, which listen, which looks at the uh, photo transistor and does a bunch of software to let it determine when the mouse has gone through. Also connected is a radio transmitter. And there's a little array of transistors, which of resistors, sorry, which set the address. And you can have up to 16 of these detector gates in one radio environment. So it should be possible to run multiple competitions at the same time using the same gear um, with relatively little risk of interference. Uh, and a single central receiver could detect them all, probably. <laughs> one day, perhaps, we'll find out. So the, the um, active devices in there poke out through a hole in the end of the wall. And then they come out through the posts, which are made up into uh, two diagonal parts in the manner described by Bernard. And they can be arranged so that you either shine right through or you reflect at 90 degrees in whatever direction you like. You can simply turn the post around and get the, the beam out wherever you want it. Uh, to make the reflector, the best material I found is the shiny wrapper from Sweets. Um, it's like a metallized. Um, plastic film. Aluminium foil is not very good. You get too much diffuse reflection. Detection of the edge um, is all done in software. Um, you get a signal, a noisy signal, almost certainly, of varying uh, intensity. Uh, and if you filter it twice, once with a, a very slow filter and once with a slightly slow filter and take the difference between those, the white line you see at the bottom shows you when the signal has a step change. This works remarkably well. And um, in tests, I can detect uh, a matchstick dropping through the gate um, every time. Um, and I figure that's probably accurate and sensitive enough. And it will do that even with a fairly large amount of ambient illumination. Battery life is good. They look bright. Um, but they have to run at pretty inefficiently. That is to say, the detected signal is a few tens of counts uh, in spite of my best efforts, partly because of the wide beam spread, partly because of the diffuse reflection, partly because of the convoluted optical path. Um, overall, I think I would rather go back and try and make a better reflective design, maybe using a photodiode to give me better dynamic range, uh, and a faster processor so that I could do better signal processing um, on the whole thing. Uh, as part of the testing, um, I made a, a sensor blaster. Uh, and the sensor blaster consists of a 555 timer, uh, which shines out one kilohertz low duty cycle pulses. These are very similar to the kinds of pulses emitted by uh, a mouse. Uh, and it all just sits on top of uh, a surplus Christmas tree light battery holder. It, it just pumps these out continuously. It's enormously bright. Um, and uh, for those of you with a mind to, it's a bit like a TVB gun, but for, but for mice, if you left that 
hanging around anywhere near the maze, mice would be crashing all over the place. So this is used to, to make sure that the uh, the timing sensor gate works even in the presence of lots of interference without having to have my mouse drive back and forth through it all the time. Uh, and thus far, I have not been able to place that in a position where it prevents detection of something going through the beam. So in that regard, I would call the whole thing successful, but I would still like to make some improvements. And of course, I would really very much like to actually try it in a contest. Well, there we go. Thank you all. Let's stop sharing. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Uh, has anyone got any questions for Peter on that before we move on? Uh, I will write it up. Um, obviously, the intention was to um, test it at Minos <laughs> in the field <laughs> before writing it up. Um, and once the, the virus came and everything was delayed, uh, that meant that I had at least six months to perfect things, um, instead of which I simply prevaricated and messed about and did nothing. So. Yeah, right. um, <laughs> The uh, the virus has a lot to answer for in that regard. Um, I will return to it. I've got a couple of things on the go at the moment. I will return to it uh, and write it up as it is. Um, there was also the possibility of writing it up for a, a piece for the Portuguese conference, but I'll just write the whole thing up and shove it up in due course, probably before the end of the decade. <laughs> okay, you are welcome, Peter. <laughs> Have you considered using hardware to do the edge detection? So just stuff it into a comparator and get a nice clean signal into your processor. The the problem is changing ambient illumination. So um, the the ambient can change very very quickly. Uh, even just silly things like people walking past and and light falling on it, or the sun suddenly coming out, or as in Hazelmere, the curtains fluttering to and fro to and fro. So yeah. getting a self-adjusting um, ambient cancellation, it was just easier to do it in software. Because the drag race and line follower sensors just use hardware. There's nothing technical about them. And they've had remarkably few issues. Partly, I mean, I'm using red light, so that's, that's better. I've got bigger signals. But the key seems to be getting a narrow angle on your receiver, so it doesn't <laughs> see the wall across across the way. There are numerous challenges. The worst of which in the maze contest is the fact that, uh, according to most of the rules, the maze timing sensors are one centimeter up from the ground, which happens to be bang in line with immensely powerful. Um, <laughs> and sensitive yes. micromouse yes. sensors. Um, and yes. so rather than mess around with, with hardware, um, although I can see ways to do it, right? By, by essentially by the same technique, long and slow pass, long and slow low pass filters. Um, it was just easier. Okay. We all use what we're familiar with, don't we? Yeah. We yeah. do. That's yeah. not to say, you know, that the, the hardware couldn't do with some improvements. And so a photodiode would give me a better dynamic range. It would be less inclined to saturate and descent under a, the assault of the sun. Um, and maybe even a, a logarithmic amplifier or something like that in there. But for the time being, it works. Brilliant. OK. Peter, thank you. Thank you very much. And those of you with competitive mice should watch out for a Spectator Peter hanging around the start gate with his device <laughs> in his pocket. Just up a sleeve. Yeah, that's the one. <laughs> That'll do the job. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, I'm just going to juggle now because I'm going to give a quick. Uh, I'm trying to talk and do something at the same time, which you know is impossible. So I'll just do something and then talk.
Okay, I hope everyone's got uh, a slide up now from me. Um, I've got two things really briefly to cover today. One is some enhancements to RATS, which is the timing supervisor, which um, which you've seen before and we've made some changes to. And the other one is to talk about the line follower board for UK MarsBot. So looking at uh, RATS, uh, there's a bunch of things that have changed. Again, uh, we were hoping to be able just to point to it on the display at, uh, at Minos as we all ran our mice, but obviously that's not happening. So um, we've com I've completely reworked uh, the display windows, conversations with Peter and pulling together um, what we think is probably the best of uh, other people's designs for, for uh, display boards. Um, uh, and, and I'll show you one of those in a minute. Um, there are two separate designs because four to three, so 800 by 600 and 16 to nine screens don't uh, project the same. Uh, so you can choose whichever suits your, uh, your device. Uh, the four to three is there because 800 to 600 is probably de facto the lowest common denominator on projectors uh, for results. I've put the running order into the display rather than as a separate uh, display. So now you can see when you're out, your robot is due to run. Um, and as the entries tick by, you'll see those disappear. Uh, the uh, controlled course time or the contest time that we allow and the number of runs allowed are actually now enforced by the timer. So previously we didn't, we didn't do that. We relied on manual intervention if people were exceeding their time or their runs. Uh, and now we've, we've taken that out. So it will do that for you. Uh, minimize the USB traffic. Historically, RATS was put together quite quickly to work with David's gates and we needed a display. So we put a lot of traffic on the USB because the timer device, the Arduino timer was doing basically all the work and just sending messages back to the, uh, to the supervisor for display. Uh, we've now cut that right down. So interpolating between starts and ends is all done by the supervisor, but you can carry on doing it the old way if you want to. Um, you can also ask the supervisor to do the timing for you. So actually all your gates have to do is to send a message to say, uh, essentially say start timing now and stop timing now, uh, and the PC will do it all for you. Um, it's there, again, preferably you'd use the uh, timer to do the timing so you can get down to the one millisecond accuracy, which you certainly can't, uh, uh, can't get to uh, using the Windows application. Um, added an audit log of all timer messages received. So uh, any message that's received from the timer is logged if we needed to go back over uh, an event and check a time or we were unhappy or something went awry we would be able to see all the timer messages and, and figure out what was going on if we wanted to. Um, and finally, the database that sets up the entries has had uh, Markdown added to it. Uh, again, thanks to Peter sending me that, uh, that Markdown script. It will uh, mean we can export the results in a form that's, that's ready to be uh, published onto our, our platforms without having to go through some horrible table conversions for the for the web software. Uh, so those are the changes. Uh, I'm now going to add, as well as children and animals, um, timing devices to things that you probably shouldn't uh, do live. So just bear with me while I swap windows over here. Okay, so this is the uh, four to three, 800 by 600 window of the timer. Um, I'll try and show you a few things with a mouse. It doesn't always work particularly well, but basically uh, usual header stuff, you know, which, which competition are we in, uh, which event, uh, what's the challenge that's being attempted, 
whether it's heats or finals. Uh, what's the robot name and whose robot is it? Um, then front and center is basically the current runtime. Uh, much, much larger uh, than, as, as you remember, the old display. Uh, we're also showing the time left, which will show in green if you've got time left. It'll turn to red if you've run out of time. Um, what your best score is for this robot and where that ranks in the robot runs so far. Uh, if you've uh, incurred any touches, if they're relevant to your competition, uh, and which run number you're doing out of how many you're allowed to do. Um, and I mentioned before that the running order of entries is actually now included on the screen. So there's the run order for this, this, uh, this competition. So I've got this attached to a, a test timer and I'll try and hopefully show you this thing going through. So I'm just gonna uh, I put a mouse in the, uh, in the start cell. Uh, and as soon as we've put a mouse in the start cell, we've started the, the time left ticking away. So your course time has started now. You've put your mouse in there. Uh, if we start the mouse, then uh, as you'd expect, just the, the main uh, display ticking away there quite big. And then we can finish the mouse run. Uh, and that will hold that there and include the run in the, in the table of runs for this mouse. And it's the only run for this mouse at the moment, so it happens to be the best score time. So it's actually stored up in here as well. So if we try another run with the same mouse, uh, just not quick with that one. So we've, we've, we've run the second run there. Uh, you'll see that the best score time has been updated to reflect the other one. Also notice that, that now this mouse has done some runs, uh, it's disappeared from the running order. So that running order shuffles up as, as the contest goes on. And then if we uh, go back to the start gate, try to run again. Okay, we're now three runs out of two. Um, and uh, we, you know, that's it. We're, we've timed out. We're not even trying to show a time. And that will save pretty much any uh, discussion around have I run out of time, haven't I run out of time? Uh, will this time count for me? Um, a similar thing happens. I'm just going to change that now. So now I've, I've actually selected another robot. I've said that robot's finished. So we've now moved on to Sprite 4, uh, built by Titania. And uh, obviously everything is cleared down apart from uh, the runtime for Tinker, which is still showing there. Um, I won't sit here for two minutes just to show you the uh, course time clock running down, uh, but that does exactly the same as running too many running too many runs, it will turn the, the time display red and, and stop you going any further. So that's a kind of quick whiz around what you would have seen had we been able to um, carry on and uh, do what we wanted to do for Minos. So I will stop sharing for a moment. Uh, does anybody have any questions on that before I move on to the UK Mars bot? Yeah.
it do, it do, I can tell you it doesn't do that right now. Um, so you could get to it clearly through the, um, <clears throat> excuse me, through the logs because you'd get an end of run message in the log. So you would be able to infer it from that. So that's pretty clunky, but you could. Um, we could look at it. I'd just like to think about it a bit, Derek, in terms of, you know, we could show that obviously we could we could show the time, we could show it as a red time and we could not store it. There's a bit of conditional code to go in there. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, uh, oh, you talked me out of it now. <laughs> I think it would be a good idea to show the time, <laughs> but in red, obviously. Obviously in red, and not, and not to store it as a, a legitimate run, basically. Uh, but it would it, it would give the person a, a feedback. Um, so yeah, thanks for that, Eric. I've I've made a note of it. I, I just think from quick question for me. Um, if you put the mouse in the start square and then lift it out to clean the wheels and then put it back in again, is that's not going to count as another run, is it? No, but it will have started your maze timer. Yeah, okay. No, that's fair enough. Yeah, but it won't it only counts a run as you go through the start gate. Yeah, that's that's all I wanted to check. Yeah. Yeah. I think the real issue is how you recover from when somebody hasn't done what you expected them to do. So can you restart it at every phase in the sequence, if you see what I mean? So if somebody doesn't reach the end, mm -hmm. it up and starts it at the start again, and all yeah. those kinds of things which are impossible to predict, but they're exactly the sort of thing that's going to screw you up when the stress is on on the day and somebody's done something unexpected and you're expected to sort it out. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, the the three gate solution that came that David introduced is pretty good at dealing with stuff like that because you've got the robot in start cell signal. You can determine. I've been through the start gate. I realistically, you'd normally be expecting um, a finish gate, hopefully, uh, but you can go straight back to the state of oh, the robot's back in the start gate. Uh, what would happen in that situation is it would just record another run uh, and there'd be no time stored for the first run. Um, I think the three gates get us through most of the horrible um, stuff um, because that in the start cell um, center does allow you to reset quite a lot of things. I know when I sort of came up with that, um, having the three gates and the logic around the state as to where it thought the robot was um, seemed to work under pretty much all the conditions I could think of and try in terms of putting the robot in at various places and taking it out and stopping it and pushing it back through the start gate and other things. So um, it's pretty good, I think. I think it covers most cases. Yeah, it, it's, the, it's when something happens that you hadn't anticipated, you've got a problem. Yeah. Like if you get a glitch on the stop gate, so it's showing a runtime of five seconds when everybody else is achieving 50 if they're lucky, you need to be able to disable that time and things like that. Yeah. Uh, most, I mean, most most of that would be dealt with because it's stored in the database. You can, and there are loads of queries sticking around on the back end that I haven't even shown you. You can remove times you can you know you can re you can do whatever you want to do with it it's pretty pretty robust from that point of view um the problems we have had in the past is when the um the finish gate is bouncing that's a real pain in the, the neck right so you're just getting times coming at you <laughs> uh what would happen in now is that actually the time would go that's enough you've had your runs <laughs> Uh, and we'd have to reset and do, redo the entry, but you would anyway if the, if the finished game was doing that kind of stuff. There are always going to be um, issues like that, and to a large extent, 
they are the mouse owner's problem. Um, in, in as much as if people insist on picking their mouse up and swiping it through the start gate whilst they do so, they really need to learn not to do that. Okay, you can't, as you say, you can't anticipate everything. Um, and the no. stuff you can't anticipate, you know, you no. kind of have to educate people to be a little bit reasonable. Um, there are some ambiguities left in the state machine. So, for example, if a mouse breaks the finish gate but does not go all the way into the cell, is that really a run? In Japan, it wouldn't be, um, but we don't have uh, a very good way of determining that except by eye, right? And and in Japan, there have been, you know, everything stops and people get down and have a look and go, is it right across? Is it not right across? Because that's the rule. Um, but, you know, we will come across these things and deal with them as they happen, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, just bear with me. I'm going to pull something else up now. Uh... Okay, um, I hope that you've got the um, the, uh, the the slides up now for uh, UK Mars Bot Lion Follower Sensor. I'll probably move through this quite quickly and then invite questions at the end. Um, so this is um, a picture of the UK Mars Bot uh, basic line sensor board, um, and the thing to note. That I'm talking about particularly today is the radius and the start finish markers, which are on the end of the board, which is at a maximum size for the panelizing of the, of the boards in manufacture. And to pick up the sensors, we angle those sensors out um, to pick up the uh, to pick up the the start finish marker or the radius marker. Um, this one's using the TLC R5800s. I'm pulsing them through 10 ohm current limiting resistors. Uh, so they're, they're pretty bright when they're on, uh, but they're not on very much. Um, this is uh, that configuration um, running around a track at BCU. Sorry for the video quality, guys. And um, so I apologize, the video will be fairly jumpy at your end. It just, just can't do it through the presentation. But uh, what actually came about here when I was uh, looking at the data coming back out was it was consistently under calculating the number of maneuvers that were actually existed on this track. This was the track we used at last year's Tech Fest for the Lion followers. Um, and it turns out um, that over here, one of these markers over here, the end of the marker was uh, was damaged, the tape was missing. Uh, and because the, the standard uh, detector board is relying on angling out, it's only just catching the end of those, um, of those markers. So it was in fact consistently missing that marker. Um, I did, uh, then take that back to my home track. This is home track. I'm sure many of you got one very similar. Um, a combined start finish marker, just for compactness there under, under what's actually a timing gate. Um, and uh, to have a look at what was going on with the different sensors. And I did get a hint of a, of a different problem here um, when I ran the standard board around around this small board. So what happened there was uh, I missed the first time around, it missed the start finish marker over here. Um, uh, so I had a quick look to see um, what was going on. And these are the uh, sensor plots coming back. So I'm logging here um, 
I think in practice on this one, I'm getting a sample back roughly eight milliseconds every eight milliseconds, um, uh, which which is okay uh, for, for tracking this because even at two meters a second, then the, the robot's going to spend 10 milliseconds over a marker. So we shouldn't miss markers just because of logging errors. Um, and what we actually see is that here is where I missed that start finish marker. So the red is the start finish sensor. Um, obviously, there's a, there's a nice clear reading at the start. It reads again, but it's below the threshold that had been set. Um, and uh, it then detects the start finish again at the end. Um, so not catastrophic and certainly you could manage your way around that uh, on that particular instance with just a tweak to the to the thresholds because uh, they're pretty nice um, spikes on here. Uh, but that was just for me really to see what was going on um, and in different lighting conditions and certainly on the BCU track, we had different problems with that. So uh, this is actually the standard UK Mars uh, basic line board extended. Uh, always something that we had in mind, the, the pitch of the components obviously on the end is uh, on 10th inch pitch, but also there's a 10th inch between the detector and the uh, emitter. Uh, so you've basically got a half inch uh, line of holes ready to take uh, a standard extension board. Uh, and if we have a look at the top view, you can see that basically the board is extended by uh, 10 holes, uh, five tracks wide. Um, pretty simple to do. What I did with that was I got a five pin male header, pushed out the middle pin, soldered it down to the uh, sensor board, uh, took off the pl plastic mounting, mounted the rear board over the top, soldered that on to the pins just to keep the orientation really as true as possible. And, uh, and that has uh, uh, just literally extends those tracks by, well, just under an inch, but takes them out to the middle of the markers. So um, same home track. This time with the extended sensor on it. Okay, so the second run actually was a was a, a, a learnt run. Hard to see the difference certainly on that this kind of video. Um, so the explore run on that track was three point just about three and up fifty point four five seconds. And then the faster run with a, uh, making a little bit of hay out of this very short straight here, uh, took that down to, to 3.25 seconds to complete the track. Um, kind of more interesting is what happened with the sensors. Um, and uh, Clearly, there's a, a, a difference in terms of the, the, the signal getting back for the start finish and the uh, and the radius markers, but nevertheless, the, these signals are significantly higher than they were um, using the other sensor. I mean, certainly the radius marker looks like it's uh, as high as you'd ever want it to be, uh, and nice and clean. Start finish marker is now reading at something like 500, whereas before. It was it was below 450, uh, little below 350, I think, for the threshold. So no changes, and I literally just swapped the board over, ran the same robot, but with the two, with the different board, and that's the uh, difference that you can get. Um, so pretty much, uh, it's a quick run through. It's a very simple enhancement, certainly a lot more reliable at, at, uh, at finding the finding the lines. Um, and if you're going to run a learnt uh, fast run, then you want to be absolutely sure you're getting your index markers uh, correct uh, and in the right place. Otherwise, you end up just driving off the track, basically. Um, so 
I'll stop sharing the screen and uh, invite uh, any questions that there may be. Anybody? Nope. Everyone's on. Wait, wait. The, the, <laughs> there were some low, wide pulses on the uh, the red waveform on your last graph. Do you know what that was? Yes. Um, without going back to the presentation, my my yeah, the uh, the chat test board is actually a piece of it, black MDF with the line on it, and then laid around that to stop picking up because I run very close to the edge of that board just for comfort, oh, okay. right? I've got these these other black, thinner black boards that just are laid around the edge to frame it in black. And uh, there's often a little bit of a gap or an edge or whatever. And it turns out that this, this start finish marker is typically running virtually directly over that join. Okay. All <laughs> so right, great, you, thank you. So, yeah, so you get a gap, you get it, you, you get some more pulse. You get, get more noise from it because you're reading out, but on a proper track, you shouldn't, you just, you're gonna get black still with a much clearer white line. So it looks noisier, but actually in practice, it's gonna be quite a lot better. Right, thank you. Okay. Okay, um, look into my program. And uh, having talked a little bit about UK Marsbot, we're gonna ask David now to tell us about what uh, Kez School has been doing with UK Marsbot. So over to you, David. Right, so this is basically a, a quick update on what we've been doing at uh, King Edward School in Stratford. Um, so as you can see from the, uh, the front slide, we've been building lots of UK Mars bots, which is great news. Uh, we met um, every Tuesday uh, after school for an hour and a half with 10 people or 10 pupils from year eight um, building line followers. And we had a couple of helpers from year 11 who'd um, in previous years had had some Arduino line following experience as well um, with sort of previous robot clubs I'd run there. Um, so uh, in basically about just over a year ago, we started um, the idea of building UK Mars bots with the robot club. Um, and then sort of really between then and December, um, we were doing both uh, hardware builds and also um, in parallel getting people used to the Arduinos because most of them had never done any Arduino programming before. Um, from January through to March um, was sort of improving the or oh, building the line following code and testing and trying to improve it. Um, but we also have a five meter um, drag race strip. So um, we spent quite a bit of time sort of doing drag race as well because they found that um, quite good in, quite good fun. Then, um, as we all know, middle of March lockdown came, so nothing happened basically through the whole of the summer. Um, and then in October, um, we basically got one week uh, after half term um, before we were locked down again. Um, so. We didn't get the opportunity to run the, the mice at Hazelmere, um, but what we have been able to do since um, Duncan posted out the um, UK Marsbot Mars track, um, we've actually run uh, a number of the mice on that. So we've got at least uh, some experience now and we can show you a little bit about um, what's happened with those. In terms of um, where we were, uh, we were working in the design and technology lab where we had a laser cutter and some 3D printers. Um, and we used 3D printers to make the wheels and the rear skids. Um, we had five soldering iron stations, um, but 10 people building robots. So basically in each session, we had to sort of swap with five people building robots and five people getting used to Arduino and then halfway through, um, we'd swap over. Um, and I think they all really enjoyed the soldering as it was new to most of them. Um, we had 10 desktop PCs in the DT lab and we managed to get Arduino loaded onto them, including the CH340 driver um, that we needed for the Arduino Nanos. And I also set up a website um, with 
the build instructions, some Arduino advice, and some little bits of sample code. In terms of the builds, we use the Primeroni 20 to 1 geared motors, uh, which basically gave us more top speed than they could control. So, you know, we didn't actually need anything faster than that. Uh, we didn't put encoders on because it was going to be complicated and we thought we'd get the basics sorted first and it was expense as well. Um, we were using visible light sensors for safety and we used O-rings on the tires for the printed wheels. Um, we didn't have a big track to try things out at the school. We had some blackboards that we put some white tape on and um, the boys liked ripping the tape off and putting different tracks down and things. But basically um, we used a small uh, 57 by 72 centimeter track um, with just a circle and some, some lines on it just to try things out. Um, some things went around that reasonably well once they, they've been built and others not quite so well, which is about what we'd expect. Um, once we got them running on that, um, as I say, we did go on to then do stuff with um, drag race. Um, but here's a shot of one of the better uh, school line following robots um, running on the track that um, Duncan has sent out. Um, and as we can see, it um, follows the, truck, the, the line nicely. It um, does the crossovers pretty well as well. Um, and even the tight bends, it, it's following the track around pretty well as well. Um, they didn't do sort of, you know, full pit control. Um, I think there might have been a little bit of proportional control in this one, but that was about it. Um, but in spite of that, I say the best ones um, with a bit of tuning on the speed and with not trying to run too fast, um, got around the track pretty well. So once we'd done uh, a bit of line following, as I said, we went on and um, we, we tried a bit of uh, drag race um, type stuff as well. Um, and again, here's a couple. Uh, this one, he was trying to go a bit too fast um, and wouldn't quite stay on the line. And there's always a question of balancing speed with control on the drag race track. And especially since our track um, is actually a Teflon track, so it's pretty slippery. Um, so you needed to be um, controlling it well to, to keep on the line. Uh, here's a slightly better one. In fact, this is one of the best ones. Um, and this one actually goes right the way down to the end at quite a decent speed um, and stops correctly at the end as well. Um, that was something it took um, took quite a bit of work to get them to work out how to um, do the stopping at the end and sort all that lot out. But um, a few of them managed it at the end, which was good. So in terms of um, the one that I built, because I built one as well as all the 10 being built at school. Um, in fact, I built a couple. Um, I built one with the 10 to 1 geared motors just to see um, what it could do. And I put some proportional and differential control on it. Um, but it still, um, at this stage, wasn't um, using encoders. Um, and although it has the extended um, line sensors on it, it's not detecting those and um, trying to use those uh, to go faster down the straights or anything like that. But again, um, nice smooth run. Um, I don't know how it's showing at your end, but at my end, this is a really smooth run around, around the track um, as it comes back round. And again, it's a little bit faster than the, um, the ones from the pupils at school. Um, it's around the track in 19 seconds, um, but there's still plenty of scope for more improvement, um, running it faster um, and uh, particularly doing the um, use of the, the radius markers um, to decide when it can go faster and when it should be going slower. In terms of some of the issues and problems we had, um, the Arduino software, um, you have a couple of options when you're loading up the programs. Um, and with quite a few of the nanos we had, 
um, we had to use the old bootloader option, which presumably means it had some slightly different bit of hardware um, on the Nano itself um, that was uh, reading the stuff coming in from the USB. But we managed to sort that out. But it did mean that whenever you plugged one in, um, quite often you would try and load it up and it wouldn't. And then you'd think, oh, well, I'll, I'll try this one with the old bootloader and it would usually work then. Um, we started with using um, uh, externally recharged um, lithium ion batteries. The, the ones shown on the right there are the ones we reused. Um, and they, they worked really well. Um, but um, we wanted the boys to be able to do some stuff at home, particularly sort of during the holidays and things. Um, so I got a whole load of these OK cell um, ones that you can plug a um, five volt uh, charger into, um, uh, but they were absolutely useless. Um, so if you know anybody who wants a use for 10 of these, um, that you can have them at a, a very reasonable price. Um, basically, um, as soon as you put the, the a significant load on this, the thing started off, um, the voltage dropped so low that the, the, the nano just reset. Um, so, um, it, it wasn't any good at all on those. So we've had to swap back to um, using the externally charged ones, um, which means that since we've only got a couple of chargers, each of which charge up four of these batteries at a time, it means we couldn't sort of give one to people to use them at home. Um, in terms of the build, um, soldering where things were very close together was always a little bit of an issue with people soldering for the first time with, old soldering irons that weren't that brilliant and they were a little bit on the large side um, particularly the um, wires we did wires from the uh, main board to the line follower board um, uh, those we quite often got the odd short across those which was not good um, also on the um, the little resistors right at the back under the battery that um, uh, drive the um four pole switch um we quite often got some of those uh shorted out together or what was more of a problem when they were soldering one resistor in they would block up the whole of the next one um and those were particularly difficult to then get unblocked but um well we didn't manage to do that so um uh we, we got around all these problems uh, as as we as we got them and we got all of them built which which was good and all of them were running quite well um I say we had we had a look at sort of whether we were seeing the side markers because ours weren't sort of pointing out so much as, as Ian's were um, and uh, I've put Ian's extensions on mine um, just to try it out um, I've also replaced the wires on mine with just um, a little Vera board um, connector um, which again is connected to the uh, line follower board and just plugs directly into a socket on the main board. Right, so what happens now? Um, I hoped we were going to be able to build more wall follower boards and do wall following and um, other stuff um, as per the uh, wall following board shown on the diagram there. Um, and again, I put a Vera board sort of connector interface on that one. Um, but um, over the summer, I said people could take their robots home because basically we said they, they could keep them. Um, about half the boys took their bo robots home and one or two of them did a little bit with it. Um, one of the guys went back to India, so one of them's over in India at the moment. Um, but um, with this term, all the boys are doing um, Python on Raspberry Pis in their um, computer, te computer technology class. Um, and so they wanted to do um, a Raspberry Pi based competition this year. So we've taken the same boys that have done um, the UK Marsbot, um, and six of those were um, building a single robot for the six or seven challenges in the Pi Wars at Home competition instead this year. Okay, that's about it for me. Um, I'll just okay. come back to there. Any questions? Yeah. Um, yeah. 
I'm desperately keen to know how it went with that line follower course because I haven't had any feedback of anybody else other than the grandson using it yet. Uh, really good. Um, very pleased with it. Um, it uh, lies nice and flat um, and it doesn't ruck up when the mice ran over it or anything. So, and as you say, as you can see from those little short videos, um, the mice run very nicely on it. So it was easy cool. enough to put it out and use it with the, at the school and roll it back up again and put it somewhere safe and, and so on? Um, I've actually had to use it at home um, because of the lockdown um, and not being able to get back in um, to run it at home. But what I did was I was able to go in and collect um, half a dozen of the robots in school and then bring them home and run them on the track at home. Yeah. Um, so, and I'd sort of fed back to them, um, you know, how they've done that sort of stuff. So, um, but yeah, I would have liked to have been able to take it into school, but haven't had the opportunity to be able to do that. Now there, um, I might still try and do that if if I hang on to it for another week or so. Um, but if not, if anybody else wants it, I'm very happy to um, look at being able to parcel it back up and, and get it over to somebody else. Yeah. I don't know, Ian, would you like to have it next? Because I could easily drop it over to you. Yeah, that'd be great. That'd be great, David. I, I, yeah, I'll, I'll see if I can get mine to go around it as well. Did you run yours on carpet or on, on a hard floor? Yeah, on carpet, just on carpet. And again, it ran absolutely fine. fine. Um, okay. No problems at all there, really. Yeah, Yeah. If you, want to, if you want to drop it to me, David, that's fine. Yeah, I'll um, talk to you separately and we'll organise okay, something. Okay, cool. That. Second point was the rechargeable battery. I'm just going to hold this one up. Yeah. Hello. Yep. That's the same kind of device that you've been trying to use. I'll just see if it will focus on that. Oh, so it's, a, it's yeah. a USB chargeable battery. I'm running with these on uh, Palulo 10 to 1 motors, and they're they're fine. They they the voltage is not stable. It will pull down a pull down a volt, volt when you turn those motors on, but um, it, it still holds everything together. So there might be a better alternative for you than the, the ones you had. Yeah, I think that's uh, almost certainly the case. Um, okay. but the, the thing is, you can't really tell from the specifications which ones are <laughs> going to be the good ones and which ones. Are <laughs> Absolutely right. Okay, David. Yeah. If you uh, until you stop presenting, it will be held on your screen. Right. Okay. Oh yes. Yeah. So this is a part. Of it. Right. I've stopped. Just presenting. before you um, move on, Ian. Just hello, Chris. Hi, Chris. Hi, Chris. Hi, how are you doing? Um, it was not so much of a question, but more of a um, thank you for allowing us to build the UK Mars Bar at the university. We've well. Apart from everybody here knowing exactly what COVID has done, our students did manage to get it built. Uh, I spent a lot of the summer becoming a postman and a shipping agent. And I uh, thank you, actually, Peter, Ian, and David, for sending me bits at panic moments and so forth, which really did help, actually. I think they all, in the end, managed to build it. You wouldn't believe it. Cool. Um, however, I have to say one thing that, Dave, you just said about... Um, small small soldering irons being a good thing and things being close together and kids at schools having the same problem uh university students have that same problem as well um a lot <laughs> uh because uh, when they're all remote and they're all panicking and, and so forth and i think i probably reordered i can't remember several tens of pounds of encoder boards and reshipping and reshipping can I have another one can I have another one um but I, I think on the whole they got it they got it pretty much there um, and of course we've only just started seeing them again so um, we fully intend to do it all over again this this time around um, we will certainly have um, a, a bet on our next revision the pad sizes and um, stuff are, are definitely and the whole sizes are definitely too small I, I acknowledge that that was me being somewhat selfish with soldering skills um, <laughs> how how uh, many have you built at the university, mm. there were, um, believe it or not, I started building my own. Um, we had 15 of them being built in the end, I think. That might have included oh, powers, isn't it? Um, and it will be nice to get them all. Once I, I, I've only just um, 
seeing those students for the first time because we all operate in uh, opposite weeks at the moment but hopefully we're going to try and get to see where they got to in in the in reality apart from the videos they would have uploaded as part of their submission point um but yeah on the whole there was there was a, a decent amount so um yeah again it's something that we're going to look at doing again because the resources that you put out were fantastic um ian and dave i think you both did a guest lecture for fires uh yeah, and so on. So that was that was really really helpful, um, and yeah, so thank yeah. you. And I, I'm looking forward to this nonsense being over and the club happening again and um, yeah. getting to see some people. Um, Ian, just um, if there's a bit of time at the end, just so that I can give you a little update on what's been happening at the university, that would be useful. If that's okay. that'd be cool. Uh, we can just we can hold the call open at the end there, Chris. As we, as we finish, that'd be great. Um, okay. David, thank you for that. Um, I'll just go to faddle around again for a moment. Can everyone see the Claude Shannon? Yeah. Yeah, you can see the presentation great. So yeah, I mean this this goes back quite a way. Um I, as far as I know, in, in terms of robots, this is probably the first. There is um I think I've put a link at the bottom of the presentation which um we'll we'll send out. The um obviously people are interested in mazes and animals before this, even even this even some stuff in the nineteenth century. Uh, but in terms of in terms of may solving robots, I think this is probably the first. Um, and he worked with a, there was a few other people doing robot research at the time, um, and he had some students working with him. He was he was mentor for people, and there's uh, suddenly this explosion of may solving robots happened just after in the fifties, sixties, and seventies. A lot of them look like Theseus, which you'll see in a minute. Um, and obviously, part of the thing was that that uh, images uh, appeared in lots of magazines, appeared on TV, um, and uh, probably is a direct inspiration for Micromass, I guess. Um, so it is that Claude Jan, right? Father of information theory. Some of you, if you've done uh, things like uh, electronic engineering, uh, be aware of Shannon's law. It's not the only thing he did. There's a, there's a bunch of stuff. Um, as well as well as 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 a um, as a character as well. I mean, apart from the fact that he that he effectively put a load of stuff that uh, even in the even in the nineties and and uh, into this century, people are still debating. Uh, he's also a really interesting character, as as is a case when you find people in history. He, he's got. I mean, he, he rolled through Bell Labs on a unicycle juggling at one point. He built one of the useless boxes. He wasn't the first to do it, but he built one. He built a machine to solve Rubik's Cube. He built um, talking chess solving machines. He built uh, a Roman numeral computer. Um, I don't know why, probably because, you know, because he could. Um, great tinkerer, uh, motorized pogo stick, rocket powered frisbee, you know. Um, so anyway, I, I just, because could, you could t do an entire conference, I'm sure, on, on uh, on Shannon, um, so um, I, I, at the note at the bottom of this is to do with the fact he, he did work at Bell Labs uh, with telephone relays, um, and and you'll you'll see why that's relevant in, in a minute. Um, so the first, as far as I can tell, um, and he presented a paper a, a paper at um, the eighth, eighth conference cybernetics in fifty one. Uh, and it's likely that that some of the early these early prototypes were built in 1950, um, and the key elements I'll show you the insides in, in a minute were solving by trial and error, a five by five maze, which is uh, a size that's quite popular for 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 um, for people's houses. They had a sensing finger and 75 relays, so there's no valves in this design. Um, obviously, people like uh, Bell Labs or AT and T would uh, a lot of their switching gear would have been built of relays uh, with logic inside. Um, I, I think, I mean, he did um, just, just 
talking about Shannon himself, his paper at MIT was to do with the, the application of Boolean logic and the ability, for instance, uh, he posited about uh, uh, switching. Because a lot of the uh, a lot of the, the switching on telephone circuits was done manually at the time, as, as you all probably know. Uh, I think the guy, at the VP of uh, technology at, at AT and T, actually said it wasn't wasn't true, uh, which obviously it was. Um, right. So this is the this is the 1950 1951 design. Uh, there aren't a lot of pictures of this. There's, there's a there's a set of Theseus, which is the second or the second set of mice, based on roughly the same principles, which is the one you see in all the videos and all the pictures. As far as I can tell, this was, um, it had an XY um, design. Uh, so these, these uh, lead screws, um, pretty, pretty classic design. It had plugs where you plug in the goal. And it had, as you can see on the, on the uh, left-hand side, a sensing figure, a piece of wire and a lamp, right? And, and it would run through, and I'll talk about the, what the maze walls were on this particular design in a minute. And it had some stuff at the bottom because obviously these are on lead screws. You can't you can't move it manually if you want to uh, show the the sort of mouse as it were uh, running from um, a particular place. So you could set it in manual mode. You see the switches down the bottom. You could you could manually control the motors, switch it back into automatic mode, and solve the solve the maze. Um, so. Um, not many pic not many uh, pictures on this slide. I apologise. So basically, when it, as it reaches the centre, it decides which way to go. It hits a partition. I'll talk about how it does it on this 1951 one and the 1952 one. It hits a partition in reverse. Go back to the centre. New directions chosen. Uh, when it reaches a goal, uh, when it detects the goal, it's it, the, when uh, it, when the wire hits the goal terminal, it stops. Lights a lamp. Lights a lamp and rings a bell. Uh, if you move it back to a, a starting point, it remembers the solution and goes to that solution straight away, right? And it'll always remember that solution. Uh, if you move it to an unexplored position in the maze, it will go into explore mode until it reaches known territory and, and goes to a known region. Um, it's also got, um, uh, uh, I, I was going to say code, but it's not code. It's got, it's, it's, uh, it's got uh, a counter built in. That if you move it, if you move the maze walls, um, it can end up in a situation where it effectively circles, uh, not knowing how to get get out. Uh, there's an actual 24 step counter that will force it back into explore mode, so it can solve the maze again. And the solution isn't a trivial one. So we've got obviously in micro maze we do line follower, uh, sorry wall follower competitions. This has got enough intelligence to solve any. Uh, Five by five maze. Um, there's a couple of there's a few sheets that are, that are still still around. I, I quite like this. The first one talks about the barriers. So on this uh, uh, first uh, prototype, if you like, a nineteen fifty one, a nineteen fifty nineteen fifty one, they use effectively bent paper clips where the where the where the wire sensor touches uh, along the uh, edges of each square, and you just slip it over the corner posts. Uh, the other, the other uh, bottom right here talks about the memory array, which I think is quite interesting as well. So, the, the, just before I go on to how it's stored, it's, it's effectively logical. Um, you notice that there is scribbled out. This was just from some from some notes I think he sent to a colleague. Scribbled out the number twenty five of those, about fifty. Uh, obviously, with a five by five maze, you've got twenty five cells. And you need two bits to store which direction you exited from that uh, from that um, uh, cell of the maze. Uh, so obviously it's fifty fifty uh, relays. I, it makes me it makes me happy that that uh, I'm not the only one that makes mistakes. I'm, I'm sure he's you know just his his whole history is of amazing things with Claude Shannon. Um, so this, I've, I've got, a, this is one of the sheets that's quite interesting. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of it. Uh, you notice there's some handwritten notes on it. It goes to the exp expiration, the goal strategy, avoiding circles and general notes. Um, if I show the top of that, it looks like pseudocode, right? It's a basic description, a, a, a human level description, English description of how uh, each bit of the um, computing program works. 
Uh, remember, this is all relays. So 75 relays, 25 reviews for the for the maze. Um, it looks like there aren't actually a lot of, I, I couldn't find any wiring diagrams, but from these notes alone, there's enough to figure out, for instance, you need some sort of state machine based on relays. There's some sort of uh, set of relays doing a, some sort of sequential count. Uh, you know, so you, so you know whether you're reading the direction, whether you're making the notes, whether you're rotating, um, whether you're starting the motor, uh, which way you're going. Um, so so all of this is sort of, it, it's just interesting to read. And it's written, I think, uh, obviously, you know, a lot of us on the call have been, been uh, writing computer programs, but I think, I think anybody could probably read this and go, I get an idea of how it's written. Um, the uh, also that even the paper that was presented in the cybernetics conference was readable right and there were there were articles in life magazine a whole bunch of different uh, obviously engineering electronics uh, electrical magazines uh, but even things like life magazine there were descriptions of basically how it worked um uh so th i think this is really really good uh, i won't go through all the details uh so then 90, the 1952 Thetius mass. So this is the one we see all the pictures of, right? This has got a physical uh, mouse that moves around the maze. I've got a, I've got a, a video, although um, play, play, uh, uh, playing a video, I've, I've given the links of, of a video online because uh, it's not a downloadable thing. Um, if, I, if I've got enough time, I'll, I'll play it. But otherwise, you can watch the link. It's Shannon himself talking about the way the mouse moves around, what it can do. Uh, right at the end, there's a quite a, quite a nice uh, bit where he, he shows his sort of sense of humour. Uh, it sounds like quite a, quite a joker. Um, it was pretty. It wasn't too bad in terms of speed. So it took took the it took about two minutes to learn the maze, about ten to fifteen seconds to to reach the cheese to, to get to the, to the solution once he solved it. His wife Betty, his second wife Betty, um, obviously not with a lot of these. Uh, people get help. The, the, uh, Bell Labs, he had, they had uh, uh, prototyping rooms, people who build this stuff. This stuff was tended to be, he actually built it at home, right, with his wife, Betty, who was a mathematician at Bell Labs. Um, so it's sort of interesting that he built a lot of his gadgets at, at home. There were several copies of this thing made, as far as I can tell. Um, and there's a, there's a couple more photographs uh, later on in the, in the presentation. This, uh, just to show you, uh, so they, they built, um, I think this was done for Life magazines, these photos. So this shows you they built a mouse, which was basically had, um, uh, and I'll talk about that in a minute, it basically had a magnet in. They put a, um, a, a light on the top of it and then took long exposure photographs. And you can see the start, uh, which is sort of a uh, top left, you can see the, the the mouse or the mechanism exploring the maze, getting down to the and then getting down to the the target cell. Um, in a way, I mean, I've got a bunch of information about how it worked in in theory and how electrically it worked, but um, it's it's sort of something I'd, I'd actually like to uh, look at and see in real life and I don't know, play with. Uh, all these walls were removable. Uh, you can see that in the video where he changes some of these walls. Um, and then once it's uh, and the thing on the left is this thing they must have built for 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 Life magazine. Uh, the and, uh, the original mouse actually was carved out of wood. This one had a, um, a, a cell and a and a and a, and a bulb, um, and also had the the contacts and the the magnet in, inside. Um, this sort of shows uh, once it's solved it, which is image one, uh, you put it back to the start, it goes straight to the goal. Uh, you put it in a different location uh, along the path and it will get straight to the solution. Number four is where it hadn't, uh, where, it, where it put it in, on an unexplored square and you can see uh, obviously it rotated uh, several times before it found the way out. And then as soon as it gets back to a known path, it goes straight to the goal. Uh, this is the this is uh, 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 one of the mice that he that he ran round. Um, hollowed hollowed wood carved to it. Had a two inch magnet in the middle. 
um, brass wheels for legs, a pipe cleaner for towel, two copper whiskers, um, and then the cheese was a as a as a was a brass um, terminal that rings a bell when touched by the whiskers. Um, so the color photo, I guess a lot of the magazine, a lot of the images on that that I've got that I've got on the web. Um, for magazines that are previously black and white, there's a, a color picture of the insides. Um, so you can you can see the along the so on the far right, that's the um, the head that rotates. There's an, obviously a, a magnet on there uh, that rotates the um, the mouse on the mouse surface, and you can see the the um, uh, the left and the the uh, left right and the the up down. Uh, axis that it moves on. Uh, you could just see uh, some wiring in the top, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so the wall sensing, and this this is an interesting question. How did it? How, you could you could take pick up the mouse and put it anywhere in the maze. So how did it know where it where it was in the maze in order to to move the x and y uh, to the to the correct position? And the answer is read switches. So every uh, cell position and a re switch in when you put the mouse down the magnet trip, trip the read switch and then the the movement head would move to that cell to match the mouse position um, the wall sensing was interesting as well so the walls were aluminium and the floor was aluminium Rem reminds me of the old uh, 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 Dalek doctor of the Dalek film where all the Daleks were on metal floors um, it looks like the wall, the, the posts and the wall, walls were, were isolated from the floor. So then, uh, as per the original one that had the 1950 one that had the wire, uh, the, the mouse itself between the whiskers and the uh, brass wheels uh, provided the electrical contact for it to know when it hit a wall. Um, and the goal, obviously, was an, another isolated brass cheese. Uh, so, so again, that that uh, he knew when when it hit that. Um, so, uh, um, I don't know how many how I'm doing on time. Uh, I've I'm guessing about running about out of time, Ian. So I've got to remember to turn off mute. Uh, I got a five minutes, I think, Max Rob. Yeah. Got, yeah. So. Uh, let me let me see if I can play. Let me see if I can play one of these videos now. The audio is going to be problematic, no doubt. Hold on a second. Uh, let me just play a tiny bit of this video. Uh, let me just switch the audio over as well. So I want the audio input to be. I take this partition, move it over here, and suppose I move this one over here. There are over a million, million different ways you can set up mazes on this board. Now we'll take the mouse and put him back in the same starting point, and let's see what he does. He's replacing the old obsolete information with what he's now learning about this new situation. Those copper whiskers of his tell him when he's up against the wall, he has to try a different direction. Now he's through the change section, and his memory is correct for the rest of the way to the goal. You're on mute, Rob. Yep. I need to switch my audio back. Did the, did the audio work for the video? Or at least you saw the saw the video moving. I guess the audio, the audio worked. worked. Yeah, good, good. Well, I guess. I guess. Is there any questions? I, I was just comment that uh, somebody once arranged for me to go to his house. Oh, that's amazing! I, and and I actually got to see this. He demonstrated it to me. He was uh, retired at the point at that time. Yeah, uh, but I didn't have all the background that you do, so you know I didn't. I was impressed, but I I didn't know as much about it. This is great. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, just because it was uh, just because it was nineteen nineteen fifty, and he built it out of telephone 
telephone relays. And, and I think, I, obviously, the, the, the computer science was very, very, very new in 1950, right? So, um, uh, you know, I, I don't know whether H. Turing's work was even published at that point. Uh, I don't know whether, you know, I mean, yes, it was. A lot of this stuff was 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 very very new, but but obviously he had a good idea about what the algorithm was, um, uh, and and I'd like to I'd like to I think these I think there's a couple in in museums of these because there's more than one built, so uh, of Theseus. Um, I've obviously... seen one in MIT's museum in uh, Cambridge, Mass. Right. Right. Cool. Cool. Any other questions? Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm sure we'll get the presentations up and, uh, and, and you can have a look through in more detail. Sure. Okay, thank you, Rob. Thank you. That was great. <laughs> <That's> great. <laughs> so, uh, Duncan, <laughs> I'm sure yours uh, much more complicated than that, but uh, uh, over to you for maze solving. Yeah, I'll start then. All right. So I'm going to be talking about my take on maze solving. And the reason for doing this is that we haven't done maze solving on Minos for quite a few years. We did a session of it on uh, at um, Royal Holloway many years ago, where I found that everybody who said they used the state solving algorithm, when it actually came down to describing it, they do something different. So I thought I would um, put up what I'm currently using in case it for anybody or got some new ideas. I'm not sure, entirely sure where all your ideas came from, but I do know that Derek Hall uh, certainly contributed some of them. So thank you, Derek. Um, right, this version of the solver is running on an STM32 F072. I don't know if you can see that because I can't see what my camera can see. Uh, it's on a STM32 F072 at 48 megahertz on a nucleo board. It uses MPE's fourth light, which is a free download from their website. It talks to the computer over a serial lead. So what you're seeing on this screen here is, um, is a TerraTerm terminal. So it's a VT100 terminal. So it, the mouse has to send cursor positioning codes and goodness knows what else. It sends it quite quickly at 921600 bode but it does still slow things down. So this particular thing uses one of Peter's maze files. It's APEC 1988. I use the files as is, apart from copying and pasting the, the file name into the file so I can get it up here. Now T is the target cell. Can you see my cursor jiggling around over things? Okay. Yeah. That's good, right. Okay, so T is the target cell, and I can um, toggle that between the set target cell and the start cell. Now, the way the solver works is via a queue. So what the solver has done already, in fact, is put the address of this cell into a queue. And when I run one, um, cycle of the solver, what it'll do is it'll take out the top of the queue, it'll look at the four adjacent cells, if there's no wall in the way, it will put them back into the queue, if they haven't already been in the queue, and it will mark them as solved. So those S's go that those cells have been solved. I put those in in a particular order, I put, currently put them in north, east, south, west so the next one in the queue will be this north one here and when i press space again it will take take that out and have a look at the three adjacent cells if there's no wall in the way it will put those in and mark them as solved so i can do that lots of times and it will gradually work its way out towards the mouse and the interesting bit happens when it reaches the mouse it's going to eventually have this cell in the queue. And when it pulls it out of the queue, it's going to look at this cell, because there's no wall in the way, 
and say, ah, that's where the mouse is. So I can now move the mouse from where it's found it to where it's just come from. And then I reset all the solved markers, put the T back in the queue and re repeat. So if I just do this bit, you'll see the solver reach the mouse and move the mouse. Okay. So I've moved the mouse to there and I've I check in my maze file to see if I can now see a wall and I put that in where it can be seen. So each time I do that, it move n it moves the mouse on one cell. Now I don't know if that's too fast. Can you see the flood flooding out from the middle? I'm getting some nods, so I'll assume you can. So as I uh, here now I've got no wall in front of the mouse and no wall to the side of the mouse. So the solver is going to work its way out and it will reach this. This cell will go into the queue before this cell goes into the queue. So this will come out before this one does. So the mouse will turn right. OK, and we find some more walls. Everybody happy with that so far? Good, right. So I can automate that. I can press a button and it will do move do that over and over again until the mouse reaches the center. And you should see that the solver is only solving the bits it has to solve. So the area that gets S's in gets less as it gets closer to the center. So I only have to look at the cells that are relevant, if you like, between the mouse and the, and the center. I don't have to look over the entire maze. It makes it quite computationally efficient. It's quite fast at, um, at solving the maze. So if I was running this as a mouse in a maze, the next thing the mouse would do would be to reset the target square back to the start and then run the mouse back to the start. Now you'll see there's lots of asterisks all over the place. Those are cells that the mouse has currently visited, been there. So anything that is next to an asterisk, if, a, if there's a wall next to it, that's a genuine wall. And if there's no wall next to it, there is a genuine absence of a wall. Now, so far, all that the solver has done is put this cell into the maze, into the queue. But you'll see this asterisk is green. That's because it's the target cell. So if the mouse was there, then the mouse knows how to get there. So the green ones are cells that the mouse has visited that every cell that has been through the queue to get to that cell has also been visited and solved. I don't know if that makes sense. It'll make sense perhaps in a bit more. I'm going to run, um, do one of these. So the green cells are bits where the mouse knows that it is on what is currently a fastest route back to the, to the target because it's been there and the solver has reached them already. So if the mouse ever got to a green cell, it could stop solving and start doing a fast run from there using the data from the, the cells that it has been to. I haven't implemented that, but um, it's there for when I get that far with a real mouse. So if we do that a few more times, We'll see that the mouse is gradually getting closer, but it it doesn't know that it has it doesn't know of a solution to the maze yet. It probably thinks that there is a fast route down this way. Yeah. And when I press the M and tell it to solve all the way to the start, you'll see what it chooses to do. Right? So it's gone off looking for a short route over there and not found one. But it's still looking. OK, and at some point at around about here, it would have found a green cell and it could have done a fast run back to the start. 
If I set the target back to the center, which is what I would do with the mouse, um, we can do a for real run from the start to the center. It won't be the fastest run, but I get some diagnostics out when I do this and I can see how long it has taken, how many cells it has moved and how many turns there have been, which is the sort of thing you want to know when you're solving a maze. OK, so that run took just under 16 seconds and moved through 96 cells and there were 50 turns. So we're running, I don't know, four or five cells a second in terms of solving time. And that's with me doing all this printing out. If I turn out off some of the printing, it can do it even faster. So it's quite fast enough to keep up with the mouse in real time. And I need to do go back to the start again because I haven't found the optimum route yet. Having a look at places it hasn't seen before because there might have been a route and it's now now actually picked up on a green cell and it knows its way home from here but it doesn't run it any faster yet. Okay so that was 21 seconds 78 cells. I happen to know that's not the fastest route. So I will reset the target and do it again. Still not possibly the fastest route because the green cells don't go all the way back to the mouse. So it's going to have a look. Just it looked down here and found this crucial wall there. And now it's on green stuff and it can go fast. So that was 18 seconds, 72 cells, 50 turns. Let's do it again. And now it's on green cells now, I think. It's probably difficult for you to tell because of delays in the, in the system. I happen to know that 68 cells is the fast is the shortest route on this thing. So it's taken it, it 20 seconds to evaluate that route, 68 cells, and there are 30 turns. And if, if I do the same again, it'll just keep going backwards and forwards. So that is how it solves. Is everybody happy with that? Somebody stuck their thumb up. Good. All right. I'm going to reset, reset what it knows and go back to <coughs> the solver. <coughs> now, When you come to look for strategies for how you're going to solve a maze, you can choose as to whether you, the mouse is going to want to go straight on or want to turn. Now, this is strategy one, and it puts the, the, the cells into the queue, north, east, south, west. So it's going to grow up to the side, down, and to the left in that order. Which means when it comes over here near, near the mouse, it's going to reach this cell before it reaches this cell. But there's a wall in the way, so it can't turn right, so it will come from here. If I do a couple of those, it's going to reach this cell before it reaches this cell. So the mouse will turn right. It will choose to turn right at this point. And that's what happens. Okay. That's what I call strategy one. I can change my strategies. Strategy four is perhaps the one most interesting at this point. Reset everything. Now this puts into the queue this cell first. So it does west first and then north, east, south. So when I do the next one, you'll see it's growing this way first. Which means it will reach this cell before it reaches this cell. So if I do the same as I did before, now it's going to choose to go straight on. Duncan? Yeah? Sorry, could your cursor doesn't actually indicate which cell you mean. Could you try and refer to them as the north cell or the east cell or to go north or to go east? 
So you're not seeing my cursor? We see a cursor, but it doesn't seem to point at the cells that you mean. Okay. Um, right, let's see if I can do that again. Right. So with this, um, with this option, strategy four, the search goes uh, preferentially to the west. So it will reach the cell in front of the mouse. That's the fourth one up and the first one across before it reaches the cell to the right of the mouse. That's the third one up and the, the second one across. So it would choose to go straight forward when it, when it gets to the next one like that. Yeah. So the decision of the mouse as to whether to turn or not will depend on the order in which you put the cells into the maze, into the queue. And there's, I don't know, a very large number of ways you can do that. I've implemented eight strategies. I started off just doing north, northeast, southwest, starting with a different one. And that gives you these different things. If I show you the effect on the whole uh, solve, so I'll reset everything and I will do an M using strategy four. Right? So this is how it searches using strategy four. And you can see that went basically up to start with. If I reset that and do strategy one, that's what I was doing before. And it sets off in a completely different direction. Ends up coming back to the same point because that direction is useless. But um, you can see it took a lot longer. It takes a lot longer to get to the center of the maze this way. Okay. Now, strategy seven <clears throat> and strategy eight <clears throat> are more interesting because they make their decisions as to what to put into the queue, depending on which way the mouse is facing. So I think strategy seven prefers to run straight. So we'll try that. This would be a good strategy for a real mouse because it can probably run straight faster than it can turn. Strategy eight, it prefers to turn. And it does something different. Okay. And I'm getting at the bottom, I'm getting my time and the number of cells it moved and how many turns and that kind of stuff. So I can look at the data for the first run to find out which worked best. And you can play a lot of games with this. And because I can use Pete's maze files, I can download those files and try them out. And earlier in the year, I had got eight willing warriors to try them out with me after we'd written this thing. So, and particularly one of them, Miko, he wrote a Python script for testing them automatically, uh, which was great fun. And um, the definitive answer as to which is the best strategy is I haven't a clue. So some mazes are sold better with one strategy and some mazes are sold better with another strategy. Now, <clears throat> unfortunately, this has implications. <clears throat> Certain maze designers might very well choose to design mazes that are optimized for one strategy or another. I remember Derek Hall uh, tends to um, write solvers that turn right early. And Pete tends to write mazes that uh, write solvers where the mouse goes straight on. And certain maze setters would favor one or the others for their own reasons. Um, now, what this means is if you know an awful lot about your maze setter, you might choose a strategy that so solves the sort of mazes that they set more rapidly. Or you could cheat. <clears throat> You could set up your mouse so that when you set fiddler sensors in a particular way, it selects a particular strategy. 
and you can have a quick look at the maze and select a strategy before you run. This is strictly beyond the rules, but I don't know how you can stop somebody doing it if they want to cheat. Back in the day when, when we had a long complicated rule set, you had to say what your starting procedure was for the maze before you saw the maze. The mice were put into quarantine before any of them saw the maze. And you took out the maze out of the quarantine and you put it into the maze and you had to follow exactly the starting procedure that you had specified. These no longer appear in the rules. I don't know what to do about that. Perhaps we ought to discuss a rule change at some point as to whether strategy selection is going to become legal or not but I don't know how you can prevent it. Um, I think that's pretty much all I want to say, unless there's any questions. It's been my experience that there is no good strategy. <laughs> and um, even if you can see the maze and manipulate said strategy at the start, you're probably going to make a mistake. Uh, but eliminating the search penalty means that in a practical sense, it doesn't really matter if people pick one strategy or another because it all comes down to how fast they can run it, um, regardless of how they got there. Yeah. The, the, the selection of strategy isn't as simple as just get to the middle. Hmm? It's minimize the number of runs before you found the fastest route. And if you've only ah. got, yeah, huh? and if you've only got a short amount of time, that could be very relevant. I would suggest then that when you do your re return search or whatever you wish to call it, um, you set the goal, the target to be cell one rather than cell zero and never re-enter the start cell. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I don't understand why that makes a difference. Because if you never re-enter the start cell, you, you've still only done the one run until you're happy that you found everything you need to find then you go back to the start cell and start your second run yeah, yeah you only get 10 minutes or five minutes or whatever they've decided to let you have in the maze anyway sure but you know it's um <clears throat> it saves you running out of runs if you have a limited number of runs you won't oh, run out of runs yeah do, do they have limited number of runs is it uh... yes yes yeah, yeah that's sure. in the rule that's that's in the rule set yeah okay well i mean it's just a question of, as you say don't do a run. Yeah. I, re you... I remember I remember when we told Billingsley that we were trying to reverse engineer his maze design. He was very freaked out. <laughs> <laughs> so we're trying to do exactly what you're talking about. Okay. We do. Sure. Sure. We do try and game. The, the Apex mazes are open to gaming because uh, an Apex maze historically, sorry Dave, has typically had two routes um, and they always include long traits for the drama. Uh, and so that we set the mice up for Apex differently. <laughs> okay. Yeah. One time we loaded every known maze into a database, and when you ran it, the solver, within probably eight moves, it could figure out which maze it was, and then it would just, you know, go straight in. So, it, but, 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 but it was interesting that if you made enough changes, it, you kind of got screwed because you would go off, you know, we would be doing this maze map, map matching, which gave you really wrong hints. Right. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, one Duncan. question. Sorry, just okay. one more quick question. Uh, Duncan, do you, um, I'll ask you the other question some other time because it's going to be complicated, but it, as far as I can tell in your search algorithm, at no time do you calculate the cost from, uh, of the cell that you're in relative to the gold. You're only ever interested in what direction to go. Is that correct? Yes. If you want counts, if you want to count cells back, you can you can have a count, and what you put into the 
cell is the count of the cell you came from plus one. Yeah. But because yeah. you haven't explored all the routes, you've only explored some of the routes because you don't put things in through the queue twice, you can't establish what the turns were. Sure. Because there might be another route to that cell that takes mm. that takes more steps in the queue, but has got a fewer turns. Okay. Thank you, Duncan. Thank you. Um, always, always. I'm always pleased to get there, let alone find the find the quick route. <laughs> <laughs> but um, okay, uh, Peter, can I just a quick aside to you? Uh, yep. we're, we're running over. We talked maybe put the Nano 33 into the first robots yes. tub. Yep. Yes, you can postpone that. Okay. I'll, so I'll decode that conversation for everybody else on the call. Um, so what we're going to do is uh, I, I will ask at the end, we have a, a, a fairly informal monthly virtual robots club uh, and we have been holding it um, on the first Tuesday of the month, pretty much. Um, uh, and I will send out a questionnaire to people on the call. I'll send you a link in, in, in a moment or by the end of the call. Uh, just get your views on whether you, one, you'd be even interested in, in joining such a call. Uh, and if you would, what sort of times work best for you uh, and whether you'd be prepared to, to talk at it. So I will send out yet another uh, link. It's not a quiz this time, it's just straightforward canvassing your views um, but uh, that was the sense of what I was just talking about so the so the first robot meeting that we have subsequent to this conference we will be putting in Peter's presentation on the Nano 33 board in place of the Arduino um, so we won't be doing that on the end of today otherwise we'll all be getting exceedingly tired so I think that takes us to Gary now yep can you hear me okay Yep, loud and clear. And can you see the presentation? I can, yep. Yeah. Okay, so this is uh, partly a pickup on some previous calls that we've had in the effectively club, le club level. Um, I kicked off a, a sort of idea of making some alternative replacements for the Pololu motor encoders for the 12 millimeter gear motors um, and Stephen and Peter kicked in very early and Derek Hall gave us some very useful advice so thanks very much for that Derek. Um, so I'll jump into this fairly quickly so this is a sort of half hour presentation squished into five minutes so I won't be reading everything. The important thing about the uh, project mission is to replace both parts of the encoder not just the magnet disk uh, but also the populated PCB. Um, and part of the reason is to get a much higher resolution or more counts per revolution of the motor, where 36 would be quite nice compared to the 12 that you get off the Pololu, or if you're running on some nice 100 millimeter radius uh, circumference uh, wheels, uh, 40 or 50 might be a nice number. Um, it's not going to be manufactured, so it has to be DIYable. Um, and the purpose of it was also to get it cheap enough that it might be attractive to people who aren't currently putting encoders on their mice. Uh, and the rough cost estimate was the Pololu off the shelf come in at a, a bit over eight pounds, including that. So if each encoder, if a pair of encoders came in under four pounds, that would sort of seem worthwhile. Uh, Stephen uh, almost immediately cut a uh, a, a shot at the encoder wheel uh, and this is all built around one millimeter diameter one millimeter long magnets you can buy these from lots of different places several in the UK like guys magnets um, and so that is a two millimeter thick piece of acrylic uh, however uh, Pete fairly quickly worked out that the Pololu encoder sensors are at 90 degrees and what we want to do is be able to make first of all an encoder disk which works with the Pololu electronics so that we don't actually have a critical path on the electronics in order to figure out whether the encoder disks are working but also so if somebody wants to they can just upgrade an existing set of Pololu encoders with new encoder disks. 
And so because the encoders are 90 degrees, the, clearly you can't divide the circle by a quarter or your two encoders won't be in the right place. Sorry, Gary, can I just interrupt? The presentation isn't showing for me. I don't know about anyone else. I'm just seeing the first screen. Really? Is anybody Snap. else seeing? Snap. Yeah, just the first screen, Gary. That's wow. better. But we didn't see the second screen, the second sheet. Now I can see the third. Agreed. Oh. Yeah. oh, that is very peculiar. I wonder why that is. So if when I hit play, and does the screen change for you now? No. No. Okay. Although, yeah. So now we're on just the third screen. Yeah. Okay, so I'll just uh, make make this as big as I can and just walk through the slides. Um, and so what's really happening is you want your motor, your sensors, to have one sensor under a magnet and one sensor in between a pair of magnets. So the second uh, stab at this was 14 magnets, and that's 28 counts per rev with alternating magnets. And uh, Pete made one with uh, CNC mill and uh, Stephen made one or two with his laser cutter. What we eventually got to was 18 magnets fitting on a piece of material about 9.4 millimeters or less in diameter. And so those 18 one millimeter diameter uh, magnets are packed in fairly tight. Now, because we can test this whole thing with the Pololu encoder, uh, we have, and both Pete and uh, Stephen have these rather nice oscilloscopes that uh, can dump pictures, and this is from Pete's Rigol. And so you can see the upper sensor and the lower sensor, the yellow and the blue, is showing that these things are nicely, uh, of, uh, if you like, <laughs> out of place. So we have some confidence that the encoder disk works, and we also have a little bit of confidence that we can make some progress on the encoder sensor PCB. What I wanted to do was make the encoder sensor PCB a little bit easier to use. The Pololu perches on the end of the motor, and so the boss of the motor is on the back of the PCB holding it away, and there's a gap. And it seemed much nicer, if possible, to be able to sit the PCB over that boss. And so the lower picture is indicating that this is the motor boss sticking through a PCB. It's Pololu co compatible connections, of course, so we don't have to write a whole big pile of new build uh, guides. Um, and it has to fit around not just the motor boss, but also the solder tag, so you can solder the whole thing onto the back of the motor. But in fact, once it's sitting on the back of the motor, if you wanted to, you could glue it on. The other thing I wanted, and it's part of the reason that the whole project got started, was um, I stumbled across some dual hall sensor ICs, and it seemed much uh, easier to set that sort of thing up if possible, uh, rather than have two sensors um, and uh, have to worry about the geometry uh, a lot more about the motor encoders disks. To make it DIYable for schools, and I've said this in the past, um, I got taught how to do 1206 SMD parts using a toaster oven oh, about 50, 14 years ago. Um, Kids seem to be able to do that from the age of 11. So this is a pretty straightforward piece of technology from a school's perspective for those schools who've made the leap into SMD. So set, setting off on a blind path, I was looking at some encoders sensors with a pair of Hall elements in. But Derek Hall called out attention to Allegro Micro, and they make these 3D in theory, but 2D in reality, dual hall sensors. What's happening is each IC has a, 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 any permutation, sorry, any combination of two hall sensors from three directions. So one hall sensor senses in X, another in Y, and another in Z. And when you buy the IC, you choose a combination of those three axes. That seemed a brilliant part and got very excited. The only downside is that the A1262 is not a 3.3 volt part. So uh, fairly naturally, 
Peter dug around in the Allegro site and he discovered the APS 12625 and APS 12626. It's the same physical package, so the same PCB would work. <laughs> But the important thing is it runs from anything from 2.8 to 5.5 volts. So with one PCB um, assembled, you could run this on a 5 volt mouse or a 3.3 volt mouse or even a 3 volt mouse. And so the way that it's actually working, if you want to think of it this way, is it's taking the, the vector product of an X and a Y or an X and a, a Z uh, magnetic vector and it's working out what's actually happening. And so its outputs are either quadrature from those two sensors, or you can have speed and direction. And the great thing, of course, about speed and direction, if it works properly, is you only need one pin that can field an interrupt in order to keep up with it, or even hang a counter on it. And so both of those parts uh, do exist, and you can buy them in small quantities from DigiKey or Arrow. The other magnificent thing about this particular sensor is it's much less sensitive to the magnetic pole number and spacing than two physically separate uh, sensors that are both expecting a magnet to move over the top. And so you choose which permutation of di dimensions you want and you pick the appropriate part. Mm. So, uh, yep. Sorry, sorry, carry on. So uh, uh, APS 12626 is a quadrature, and this particular one I've picked randomly is um, the z-axis and the x-axis, and that turns out to be a B. So you can get an A, a B, or a C, and it gives you a zx, a zy, or an xy part. If you choose the speed and direction, you don't lose resolution. You still get all of the edges that you would get out of a quadrature detecting system, but it also, uh, all, all of that comes out of one pin, output A. The other pin is used for direction. It's always asserted before the speed pin changes state, and it's simply high or low, depending on which direction the thing's been spinning. So it's a very nice part, and thank you very much, Derek, for finding that uh, original part, because it really set us off, I think, on a lovely track. So I designed um, a PCB originally, and then I discovered that uh, the place I was going to get it made, JLC PCB, won't make anything as small as that sensor, uh, as small as that sensor board. Um, the original was 13 millimeters wide, 16.5 millimeters tall with 1206 components. And it's all just chopped up with V cuts. And so what I did was I sent that away to Seed Studio and I did in uh, subsequently or in parallel, um, a slightly bigger, which wasn't very hard to do, 16 by 16, which JLC PCB will V cut. And for giggles, I decided to try an 0805 component size and chop it all up using uh, routing and uh, breakaway tabs and uh, or mouse bytes. And so I've got myself three panels of this stuff uh, in those various formats. Uh, they cost for the Seed Studio, I got about um, 300 PCBs for less than 15 pounds. So it was under the VAT floor. So it wasn't very expensive to do. So this is what the JLC B PCB panels look like. So the top one is the 16 by 16 chopped up with V cuts. And the bottom is the uh, 13 by 14 chopped up with mouse bites or breakaway tabs. I was stunned to discover because I did deliberately oversize the uh, motor bore, uh, motor boss hole. Um, Pete and I looked at the tolerances on this and we guessed that 5.1 millimeters would be easily big enough to fit over any motor boss. Um, when these things came back, the holes in the middle were about 4.9 millimeters in diameter and they weren't cylindrical, they were conical. It was like they pushed a reamer into the thing and reamed out a conical hole. Uh, and so none of them fit, which was deeply uh, upsetting uh, in some abstract sense. More surprising because I've used JLC PCB quite a lot of times and I've never had any problems with them. Um, the only thing I would say other than 
the disappointment about the holes needing quite a lot of work, several minutes of work with um, just emery paper rolled up in a tube to make them big enough to fit on the mouse uh, motor boss, is that the I deliberately wanted to try and make sure that I could have a shot at their free SMT process. And so I made these boards fairly stiff. They won't take V-cut boards. You can only use breakaway tabs on PCB panels if you want to go through GLC PCB's SMT assembly process. Um, and unfortunately, I made the holes a little bit too far apart, so they're quite tough to break. Uh, if I was going to do it again, which I am, uh, I'll move the holes fractionally closer together. But basically, they're there. They need some emery paper or a file or a Dremel to make the holes around the motor bosses bigger. And I've got about 300 PCBs if anybody would like some to play with. Uh, 300 of each uh, of these two designs. Um, I was hoping that my Seed Studio, and I deliberately got them in a different color because it takes no longer, uh, costs nothing, and I thought I'd be able to spot them. Difference. Uh, the ones that I got from Seed, which were VL uh, V cuts, uh, they're a disaster. Only the left hand edge of a panel uh, is any good. I can't, I'll try and blow it up, given that I'm not actually showing this for real. I'll see if I can show you the photograph. But hopefully, you can see that what's really happening is. The connector at the top of the board is acting like a load of stamp holes or mouse bites, and the PCB material is actually breaking out of the middle of the PCB, and it's still attached to the leftmost board. So there's a great wadge of material missing, um, and this is almost completely hollow underneath those uh, solder pads. So that's not super great. Um, it's the shallowest V cuts I've ever had off seed. I'm not sure if they were just looking at the board and thinking we'd better cut it shallow or something, but I've never had such a bad job off seed before. Uh, can you guys see that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, bit, bit sad, but there you go. Go back to 100. Um, and so they, there are still, um, because it was cheap, I got 10 panels, so I've still got about 60 PCBs, which are completely usable uh, because the edges uh, are pretty much uh, solid and integrated. They don't break up very badly at all. So the things are usable, but the only the left-hand panel is actually usable with connectors. So I've got about 60 of those if anybody wants some to play with. Right, so sticking them on the motor, you can see that uh, it sits completely flat with the Seed Studio red PCBs. And after a bit of rubbing with a tube of uh, emery paper, uh, the other JLC PCB PCBs fit quite nicely on the motor too. So there's a 1206 version of a board from Seed. There's a 1206 version of a board from JLC PCB. And there's an 0805 version of a board from uh, JLC PCB, and this is the 0805 board with the sort of nicely contoured routed edges. So the next steps, um, get some rework done uh, by sticking some emery paper, a Dremel or something through the holes, smooth out the PCB edges, um, and I'm going, I'm about to complain and try to have them remade because I, I thought my CAD was wrong until I got the boards back from Seed, um, and it clearly isn't the CAD because Seed made the hole pretty much spot on. Uh, and also, Seed's hole is cylindrical rather than conical. Um, I'm going to, if I want to pursue the rather nice V-cut board with Seed, I'm going to have to do something about those uh, turning the connector into mouse bites. And the simplest way to do that is to just run a router down that edge uh, and pair them up in a way that I did before. So we've got to assemble and test the encoder PCBs. I've got all the parts. They actually have turned up. Um, my DigiKey uh, account went into some very strange pending status for a while. Uh, but all the parts are here. Um, the other thing is Seed did such an awful job. They took uh, about three weeks because it coincided with holidays and all sorts of stuff at sending the boards back. They've given me a $5 off coupon. So I'll redo the board. 
and send it through that five dollars off coupon so i'll only be paying postage and packing um, and i'll try a different pcb panelization technique so to costs we've got um quite a lot of uh, encoder discs done but for a 36 uh, counts per revolution using that technique where the the uh, holes are circular holes and the magnets poked through. Uh, if you buy this stuff from AliExpress, the one millimeter by one millimeter magnets would come in at about 60 odd pence for uh, 70 odd pence for that, for one encoder disc, uh, plus the PCB material uh, or the, the material that you use in order to make the disc you can get about 600 discs out of a sheet of A4 material. And so it's literally pennies for an encoder disc if you can get at a piece of machinery that can make it. Um, we're very lucky that Stephen has access to a laser cutter. Uh, if you have a fab lab or a laser cutter at work or at school, you can do exactly the same thing. The populated encoder PCB, assuming it's about 10 pence for the PCB, it, all the parts, including the PCB, are less than £1.20, and these prices are all including VAT. So overall, the thing is less than two quid. Um, so I'm pretty pleased, though I've been dithering and uh, distracted. Um, we have made reasonable progress, or certainly Pete and Steve have made reasonable progress, and at least I've found out some facts. So I apologise for the romp through, but all of the slides are available already. Um, I can just email you a link. Any questions? Yes, absolutely, definitely, Gary. <laughs> um, it would be um, great to um, explore some of this with you, maybe not now, but certainly for the students that built um, the UK Mars bot in our second years, that would be very helpful and very useful. And the um, little bit of introducing them to SMD that I've been trying to get them to do for ages, that would be wonderful. If we could have a chat offline, that would be great. Yeah, absolutely, Chris, no problem at all. I, mean, also, I, I deliberately did this 1206 because I remember you and I making stuff with 1206 oh, yeah. and it wasn't very difficult at all. No, not at all. Um, and also, um, if you do need some prototypes making, I still got my little machine working. Um, if oh. so, prototyping wise, that is. Um, and hopefully we will be in receipt of a pick and place machine very soon that will take um, panels on a conveyor belt. So there's something else we might be able to look at collaborating on in the future. So not less a question, but more of a, um, I really like that. Well, I mean, if, if you go and uh, load up a machine capable of making uh, a set of boards, one panel, the lowest number of boards I would expect on a panel would be 15, but 20 is more likely. Um, and so that would be pretty much your your class done in two panels. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. indeed. Um, and I'd love to pick your brains at some point with um, panelization because I've been having a, a right game of it with <laughs> getting it to work. So you seem like you've got that cracked. So I'd very much like to pick your brains at some point with that. <laughs> Well, I would deny having it cracked. If you look at this central picture here, <laughs> you, you can see this dirty, great, big piece of material hanging out the side. So, or, put, put unless that, you mean cracked in a different way. The board, no. The, the process, I think you may have cracked. The Perhaps their manufacturing process, they uh, took the word cracked. Volume production line. That V-score problem doesn't surprise me at all. I've seen worse that way. David, now, you've got a question. Yeah. What's the um, best material for the encoder disk that the magnets sit into? Um, I'm just thinking I've potentially got access to a laser disk at school or a laser cutter at school. What? Uh, Stephen's recommendation is um, laser cut balsa. I believe that's still the case, Stephen. He's there. Um, yeah, I mean, I think Sorry, it was um, balsa or um, mounting board for um, pictures. A picture mounting board comes in at 1.25 millimeter. It needs something with a bit of give in it because um, the tolerances aren't perfect. I found it easy enough to get two millimeter MDF, um, as you saw there. And <clears throat> although I don't have a working laser cutter, 
yet. It arrived yesterday. Um, mm. ooh, the um, two millimeter MDF uh, is quite a nice material to machine. It should laser perfectly well. And yeah. the extra thickness helps keep um, the disc from kind of weeble wobbling on the shaft, I would suggest. So something reasonably stiff, um, but with just enough give to, to give a firm grip on the shaft. There's lots of materials that will work. Uh, so laser are, the seat... are the magnets just pushed in or are they glued yes. in? No, they're just pushed. I The one um, that you see on the screen there, I painted over with um, CA glue to help hold everything in and make the whole disc more durable. Um, but clear nail varnish would work just as well or spray varnish or anything you like. No. The problem with the laser cutter is you get tapered holes. Well, that helps them stay in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. What is surprising is the tolerance. Um, <clears throat> what we discovered is that the nominally one millimeter magnet are pretty nominal. Um, and so uh, if you are setting up to produce your own, you're going to have to mess about a little bit to get the, just the right size to get uh, a nice press fit. Um, I was lucky um, on my little CNC mill. I have uh, a drill which just happens to produce. I can't even remember if it's supposed if it's a nominal 0.95 millimeter drill or a one millimeter drill. But in soft materials, they tend to cut slightly undersized anyway, and so the holes were a good fit. But if I took another definitely one millimeter drill, they could be a bit loose. So it's kind of finicky, but once set up, you're good to go. And I would suggest that in the long run. Uh, an A4 sheet of material on a laser cutter is going to produce a lot of discs in half an hour. So, yeah, you, you may find cut, laser cutting or 3D printing non round holes to be more mm -hmm. tolerant. So if they're slightly square, say, um, they'll accommodate a wider range of magnet sizes than perfectly circular holes. Mm. Yeah. Interesting point. Okay. And um, Pete, oh, what okay. did you go for? Oh, just the cheapest K40. K40. Chinese. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's literally the cheapest I could find on the basis it was going to still going to need that's, the same amount of work. <laughs> that, that's what I went for. Um, uh, um, it, they're very, very hackable um, and actually produce better results than the one we have at work. <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow. We must be wow. Okay. We'll exchange notes on those. <clears throat> yeah, the, the, okay. there's loads of stuff on the web. So, okay. Gary, thank you. Um, we've been watching this one through the club a little bit, and uh, the development here looks really promising and something that people are going to really use, I think, uh, as they as we build more and more UK Mars bots. Um, Gary, could you pop yourself off? Thank you. Oh. <laughs> um, So um, we're pretty much, uh, because we're deferring uh, Peter's presentation, excuse me, uh, we're pretty much at the end of the conference. I'm just now sending you that link through the same mechanism as the quiz um, to get your preferences on uh, and level of interest in a uh, a monthly call that we, we we've been doing. I have to say we don't do it every month, but um, we've done quite a few actually since the lockdown in the UK. So that's since March. We've probably done um, sort of five, four or five of those those meets. Uh, so if you can let us know. So um, we're a little bit over time, so apologies for that. But big thank you to all the presenters. Great job. Lots of interest there. Um, and that has really made it possible this year. Uh, next year's Minos date is already 
set. It's the 19th and 20th of June and it's in Coventry. Um, and we will be combining that with the, with the national competition as well. Uh, that's the deferred minor booking from this year, uh, originally in March and then in November and now uh, in June next year. Um, so really just makes me to say thanks very much for coming along. I hope you found something here that's been of interest as you've gone through. Uh, and if you can let me know your preferences on uh, on attending a video call, um, then please fill in the questionnaire uh, and uh, we'll, we'll get something set up for everybody. So Thank that's it, much. I think. Okay, goodbye, everybody. Have a, have a good evening. Okay. Good Cheers. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you, Peter and Derek. See you. Bye. Right. Cheers. Chris, how do you want to uh, progress this? Just shoot us an email and we'll sort something out at some time? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Okay. Um, I'll drop you an email um, Monday-ish. Fine. And okay. We'll do it. Yeah. Cheers, Chris. Take care. Thanks. Look forward to it. Bye. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> right so, there you go brilliant thank you for joining in from portugal those of you left yeah, good to see you Orlando. <clears throat> Yes, Peter, thank you very much for all the support. Okay, Derek, and uh, we all, guys, if you want to join with us in the Microsoft Micro Symposium, we think that we can imagine this in uh, the first time months of the year, we'll see, and maybe the Micromouse Portuguese contest at Quinta do Carasto. Okay, so. Super. So if, if, if anyone you, uh, can, can you join us, yes. we can join in. That's great. Okay. Thank you very okay. much. And thank you. Thank you for letting let us in. See you. No Cheers. Take care. See you, see you next time. Okay. Yeah, see you. Thank you.